Hello and welcome to Staying the Course. Today, we are speaking to IR Dr. Chan Tak Leong, the first person to complete his bachelor's, master's and PhD degrees at University Technology Petronas or UTP. So back in 1996, uh, Dr. Chan was among the member, members of the pioneer batch of UTP when it first opened its gate to the public. After completing his degree in chemical engineering, Dr. Chan decided to go all the way and continue to do his master's and PhD while working. In 2008, he successfully completed all three of it. I'm grateful and honored to have him with us today. Hello, Dr. Chan. How are you? Hello. Hello, Asrif. Uh, I'm fine. And how are you? I am fine. Uh, weather is nice. Enjoying some outdoors in the weekend. How about yourself? How's your weekend so far? Weekend has been uh, good. Now at least we can kind of uh, go out a little bit. So bring the kids out uh, to, you know, to their haircut you know, after a <laughs> few months. You know? So yeah, yeah, it's, it's uh, good. But uh, I think I, I hope everybody still stay safe, stay healthy. Yeah. Great. So Dr. Chan, the concept is very, very simple. We only have three questions. Uh, we'll go through the three questions as we go, um, but we'll just see where those three questions take us. Yeah? Yes, yes, yes. Great. Yes. So I really, you know, uh, like to applaud your effort, lah, Asri. Oh, I think yeah. this is tremendous effort on your end. You know, I, uh, you know, I know you write in, in LinkedIn and now you do a kind of a talk show. I think this effort to to help others who, who, who is thinking to embark on postgraduate, right? To, to understand the challenges first time and, and, and also give them some ideas or motivation. I think this, this is great. This will really encourage, I think, you know, your listeners, you know, and wider Malaysian society to continuously, you know, uh, educate themselves. Yeah, yeah. So well, well done, well done. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Chan. The idea is to pay it forward. When we were studying, we learned a lot from our seniors. Now it's time to mm. document all this and bring it to the masses. Lah. Yeah, Dr. Chan? Yeah. The first, sure, question, sure. the first question that I have for you is a very simple question. Tell us about yourself. <laughs> Who is IR Dr. Chan Tak Leong? Okay, great, great. So um, I, I think to your listeners, right, um, simple introduction. My name is Chan Tak Leong. I'm the eldest of three siblings. Uh, from a very hardworking and humble couple of my parents, right? Um, so we come from Kuantan. Uh, perhaps some of you have been to Kuantan, right? We, we come from Kuantan. Actually, I studied all my uh, primary school years, um, secondary school years, all in Kuantan. Never studied outside of Kuantan. You know, um, I went to regular government school. Yeah? Um, of course, like many, many of the uh, listeners, I, I enjoy thoroughly the secondary school life, you know, very active, lots of activities, etc, etc. But something very important happened in 1995, you know, SPM year, okay? um, you know, I wasn't the top student in class, right? but uh, something happened that year, my teacher gave me this one form, you know, and this is the form to apply for Petronas scholarship. So I think the rest is history. I, I, I uh, was offered a Petronas scholarship. Um, Petronas sponsored me to study chemical engineering right, in UTP. Right? At, at the time, it was known as Institute Technology Petronas. You know? We haven't formally chartered the university yet. So um, I'm the first batch, as you know, right? went to uh, the university uh, in Toronto, right? 1996. Okay? And fast forward, Five years, 2001, I completed my first degree, uh, chemical engineering from UTP, right? We will talk about the postgrad part a bit later. Lah, eh? Yeah. So then as a scholar, finished study, then I joined Petronas, lah, right? I, I currently still work with Petronas. In fact, um, we'll hit 20 years service in January next year. Time, time just go by, lah. zoom, <laughs> good job, yeah. Yeah. Right, and uh, I think briefly in Petronas, then I worked in many many departments, mostly in the liquefied natural gas or LNG industry, and uh, 
about four years ago, I started to work in group digital. So now I'm working in group digital. Um, on the more personal side of things, um, you know, obviously my wife uh, is very supportive and we have two children, two very cheeky ones, of course. Uh, our eldest daughter, Chloe, she's in secondary school now and Caden, well, he's still enjoying his primary uh, school life, I would say. <laughs> I see. So that's, that's kind of a brief intro, a very brief intro uh, about myself. You know? yeah. Thank you, Dr. Chan. Very interesting journey. A chemical engineer who's now leading uh, digitalization of, of businesses, yeah? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So now, Dr. Chan, the meat of our conversation will go on question number two. Now that we know you better, a bit on your upbringing and your family today, mm. we would like to mm. know more about your lifelong learning journey because um, number one, you, are, you were a pioneer uh, mm. in the UTP system. UTP has grown today as, as, as a, one of the top universities in Asia and, and, and globally in certain subjects, right? So um, walk us through the motivations as well as the challenges that you have faced when the point that you were a bachelor's degree student going into a master's student and when you decided you want to go all the way to a PhD degree. And mm. what I learned is that you also did your postgraduate degrees while working, Dr. Chan. Yes, yes, I did. Yeah. yeah. So many of our um, friends out there are keen to know how do we uh, balance time and also dedicate focus when we are doing work, family, and also study. Walk us through yeah. this journey, Dr. Chan. Okay, okay. So we kind of rewind a little bit, right? And kind of uh, uh, tell the story, right? So I think before we go into really about myself, I, I, I would really think that lifelong journey applies to everybody. Lah. You know, if you, if you look, just look at life, right? We actually, we as human beings actually never stop learning, right? You know, from the day we were born, little babies, we start to learn, you know? We start to learn by interacting with the surrounding, kan? and eventually we learn to speak, and eventually we learn to walk, and we learn simple alphabets, and we learn to form sentences, and we and 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 keep learning, right? Until today, right? Everybody is learning, right? So there is already an innate capacity in all people to learn. That's what I believe. Lah. So it's really nothing unique. Yeah. So um, you know, and, and in fact, personally, right, I, if I look at my life, right, the biggest learning curve, right, is probably when I become a first time father, right? There is no manual that comes with a baby. I'm sure you also experience the same, the, the manual, but you learn, right? And, and when, you know, you learn to react and you take care of uh, your, your baby and you, you grow with them, right? So, I think it is just nature of human being to keep learning, right? And every day, even in my job, every day I learn, I learn new things, right? In fact, you know, throughout my 20 years experience in Petronas, I have moved from one department to the next to the next. And sometimes I'm given assignment that I, I don't know how to do, right? There is no clear answer, right? So. I just be very frank with my uh, bosses. I say, okay, I don't know how to do this, but I will try and I'll learn, I'll deliver the best for you, right? So I think that is, that is what makes a, a job or our life interesting. Lah, kan? You know, if you already know everything, then I think it's going to be quite mundane or boring. Lah. So that's how I, I look at learning, right? It's, it's, just, um, it's just part of life. Right, and every day we learn and we apply new knowledge and so on. Okay. So um, let's just now dial back a bit to the academic learning. Academic learning is kind of formal learning, right? Mm. So let me just rewind a bit. Why did I choose chemical engineering in the first place, right? <clears throat> so you know, in, 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 in secondary school, I was in the science stream, you know, um, uh, classes, uh, so to speak, and of the three core sciences, physics, biology, and chemistry. You know, I love chemistry a lot. 
and I find chemistry very fascinating and I believe chemistry is the central of everything, right? It's the central to biology even, right? And so so um, there is already the interest in chemistry. And as I grew up, when I was younger, right? When I was younger, I always wanted to be a pilot, right? But somehow I decided not to be a pilot. I wanted to be an engineer. And because I love chemistry, then I thought chemical engineering might be a nice thing to do. And, and a lot of Form 5 students, right, uh, tend, to, tend to think like this. I love chemistry, I want to do engineering, so I go and take chemical engineering. A lot. So I applied, not really knowing what chemical engineering is all about, again, master two, right? And, and, and then when I do five years degree, I realized that chemical engineering has very little to do with chemistry, it's a banana, right? Okay. Chemistry is a part of chemical engineering, but it's not the entire chemical engineering, right? Engineer, chemical engineering is about applying the fundamental understanding of chemistry into production, right? In, into large scale production. And actually we spend a lot of time learning um, things like heat transfer, fluid mechanics, etc. How do we make a process happen? How do we do things safely? Right. So yeah, I started off with a little bit wrong understanding what can be engineering about, but you know, yes, I learned a lot and I I then eventually graduated as a chemical engineer, right? Mm. Now when I graduated as a chemical engineer, I I made sure that I can practice my engineering, right? So when I finished study, Petronas, uh, you know, they organized an a interview lah, and they asked, what do you want to do? So I said, um, just send me to the plant, right? Send me to a plant. I want to practice my degree lah. Now, <clears throat> not very smart, maybe. I just say send to my plant, send to a plant. I didn't say which plant, where. Can. <laughs> so Petronas can, a lot of plant, yeah. <laughs> so Petronas can. First letter that came, okay, you go to Bintulu, right? I was like, mm, where is Bintulu? Then it's in Sarawak, fantastic. I've never been to that part of the country. So I went and I spent a um, couple of years uh, working in Bintulu, right? So that's where, you know, I practiced the real engineering, uh, chemical engineering as a, as a process engineer, right? Now, let's rewind back to how I got myself started um, in pursuing a master degree. Right? Mm, yeah. Actually, you can master study uh, during the, 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 first, the, the first degree five years, right? Never, never come across my mind to do post-grad job. Seriously. It was never my plan to say, after this, I want to do masters. After this, I want to do PhD. Start. It's just not that. So, in fact, sometimes I, when I, you know, look at some people I was like, why these people, you know, go study so hard some more after the other degree, <laughs> yeah. don't, don't quite get it. Eh? Yeah. And in fact, when studying, it's like there's a law assignment and you know, uh, the subject, whether you like it or not, wouldn't have to go and do because that is the fixed menu, kan? you just, just have to do, right? Banyak assignment, banyak project and whatnot, you know, and, and just wanted to get through with it, right? And, and, after five years, two can go and earn some money, <laughs> right? So anyway, the it happened in you know in UTP we have to we we go to uh, eight months industrial internship. Hmm. I think about year four, we go to uh, uh, industrial internship. It was an eight month program. So I was very lucky. I went to um, Moco Chemicals, right, hmm. uh, in Gebeng. They eventually became VP Moco and today is Reliance Chemical. So the, the plant still exists in Gaben. But what I learned during the internship really opened my eyes. It is not just the theory, but it's about how do we make things safe in a real environment, right? Safety is the core of doing operation, is core of doing business. So safety, you know, I got inculcated with a lot of good uh, safety practices during that eight months exposure. So as I returned to the campus, I start talking to my professor, uh, Dr. Azmi, Azmi Sharif. You know, I said, look, 
we are chemical engineers and I think we have a role to make sure that the plants are safe. Now, how do we make sure the plants are safe? We should make sure that it is design safe, right? Mm. As early as possible in the design decision, we must make sure that it is safe, right? Now, how do we then choose? Because sometimes to make a particular product, there are multiple options or processes to get to a product, to the same product. How can we decide or guide the selection of the, the process steps to make things safer? So that ultimately it is inherently safer. You know, um, if I give you an example of what inherently safe is like this. If, if you compare a house that have no staircase compared to a house that has staircase, the house that has no staircase is inherently safer you know, because it prevents people from tripping or falling on the stairs. We must the stairs. Yeah. Right? So you kind of eliminate the risk during the design of that house. Huh? Okay. So same concept. Can we eliminate the risk when we actually design the process itself? Right? Because if that was design safe, operationally it should be safer, right? So that's the idea. So from one conversation, it went to a few conversations, etc. etc. And then Dr. Asmi said, Hey, you got a lot of interest in this thing. Uh, why don't you just do a master's research on it? Lah? I see. I see. So as if that is how it started, right? It wasn't like I want to do a master program. It's just like that interest, you know, after I had that exposure, you know, came back, talked to my professor, and, and after a few conversations, he said, you asked a lot of good questions. And there is no framework at that point in time, how to guide people, etc. Why don't you do a research? So that's how I started, right? Um, immediately after the um, last semester of, of the degree, I enrolled into the MSc while waiting for Petronas to, to you know, um, kind of assign me to where I should go. So I spent one semester in the campus full-time uh, working with Dr. Azmi as my supervisor. Um, in the MSc program by research. Now, I think um, by research and by pod program is quite different, right? Later on, we'll talk about what to choose or how to choose like that. But I did a by research MSc, right? And we spent a semester, about six months, trying to actually figure out what is the boundary of the research. Right? We kind of have a general idea what to research, but got to sharpen it, do literature review, etc, etc, kind of firm up to say this is my space of research. Lah. So six months kind of getting a bit more clarity, you know, but still not there yet. Typical literature review would take, you know, easily can sometime be six months to a year, lah, depending on how fast a person get to, right? So after six months, Petronas, Call. Hey, uh, you have to go work. <laughs> Where? Bintulu. <laughs> so I was like, Alama, Bintulu is very far from the campus, can? <clears throat> yeah. So I, I was like, okay, but I still have, I still want to go, not because I have to go, but I really want to go because for me, it is my part of the bargain. When I signed the scholarship, I already promised that I will serve the organization, right? So I said, I, I will go, definitely I will go. Actually, at that point, right, Petronas made give an option. Like, uh, you know, if you like to do all these masters and whatnot, um, why don't you just become a lecturer? Lah? If you become a lecturer, you know, the whole bond just transfer to ATP. But again, becoming a lecturer wasn't my yeah. my ambition, lah, so to speak, because I wanted to practice engineering. Eh? So I said, upper, uh, I told, told my professor, I said, look, mm, I now have to do this off campus part time. Can? In, I spent one time, uh, one semester full time, but now I said, uh, not much choice, I got to do it uh, off campus. So I took one and the second semester too, I take off lah, because need to adjust to work and all this kind of, you know, when to be to do, uh, sort out the work environment, etc. So six months went by, I was officially on leave from the study, right? And then I, rejoin the semester, right? 
So the beauty of doing by research is that you could take breaks. Lah. You can take one semester off, right? There are rules around it, but you can take breaks. Mm. And, uh, unlike thought courses where you need to follow your class, right? Yeah. So I chose to have a break, uh, six months, then I enroll back uh, into the program, right? Uh, different university has a different um, guidelines, but in UTP, they say for a master program, you must complete within a fixed duration, but in between that duration, you could take some breaks and things like that. I can't recall what are those numbers, but there's a guideline. So then I continue, right, into my second semester uh, offline uh, while working in Bintulu. The good thing is this. Because I got sent to Bintulu, I have no friends, I don't know anybody there. There was no social life, so to speak. Done. So, pagi office, balik, you know, malam is to read books. Ah. And read books, uh, weekend, do my research. And my research work <clears throat> doesn't have a lab based requirement, right? So, this is where later on we talk about choosing the program, right? Mine is mostly computer simulation. So as long as I have access to my computer, I can do computer simulation type of work. So all in all, I spend, uh, and then every semester I have to go back to the campus, lah, make presentations and so on, and, uh, kind of assessment for the semester. So I travel back um, <clears throat> uh, from, from Sarawak to uh, all the way to UTP every semester. Right? Um, you know, in between is phone calls and whatnot with my professors. Lah. So, uh, you know, a couple of semesters went by. And after one of the semester evaluation, I can't recall which one, UTP actually asked me, hey, um, you want to do direct PhD? Tak? I was like, what does it mean? Yes. Well, direct PhD is an option where you don't have to graduate from your MSc and then you upgrade your thesis, like, I mean, have to do a bit more work uh, and push all the way to a PhD level material. Oh, I was like, yeah, okay, sound interesting, but let me finish my master dulu lah. <laughs> At least I can have a break, right? If I, if I, if I finish master's, then I say, uh, kalau tak nak continue pun, at least I got a master's, you know? I mean, this, this is the pressure that a working person would face, right? Mm. If I was full-time, uh, I would say, yeah, no problem. I'll, I'll go direct PhD. Can just lengthen it and, 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 and complete a PhD. Why stop in between? Right? But at that time, I was like, you know, I also have work to do, but at least I come to a juncture, a traffic light, lah, so I can choose to continue or not to continue. Right? Yeah. So 2004, I completed the MSc by research. I graduated in 2004. August 2004. Now, because as you do research, right, you ask a lot more questions, right? You ask a lot more questions, which is maybe in my case is slightly outside the boundary of my core research. It's related, but it's slightly outside the core. And and we have to, we, you know, we have we we have to first if, uh, finish what's the core, right? That's how you get graduation, right? And there are questions that is lingering outside the core related, but the outside. Of course, then we map out a lot more things to do. Now, eventually there are a few more students who pursue the same area of study, each in a slightly different aspect under Professor uh, Dr. Azim. So, because this topic was, you know, in fact, quite pioneering at that point, right? Inherent safety process design. Then I was like, okay, since the banyak question me, and then Dr. Azmi said, hey, you have done a lot of work, eh? why don't you continue lah, PhD kan? <laughs> so, yeah, macam sayang pula lah, you know, since already done a few years of work. So I said, okay lah, let's finish masters, let's just register and continue PhD, right? So that's, that's how it is lah, actually. And then I continue PhD. But because I was researching on the similar area, right? I have strong fundamentals in that already, right? I didn't have to restart from zero, right? Uh, if I went to do a PhD in completely different area, then I had to restart in zero and I wouldn't have completed the work in such a short time, right? Because 2004 and actually I 
eventually graduated 2008, right? Four years for a PhD on part-time is quite fast. Huh? Yeah. Um, uh, it's because I have the background already. Huh? So went into PhD and because that topic at that point in time, when we do our research across the globe, right? There were probably three or four PhD theses in that area, right? That I was pursuing. It is very niche, very pioneering at that point in time. This is look, this is about 2008, right? So quite some time ago. So you see, when, when doing research, I think the challenge, right, is there's no answer. <laughs> If you compare to doing undergrad, right, there is answer. The textbook at the back, there is some answer, right? Mm. Or at least the methodology is very clear. You can get the answer. That's undergrad. But as you pursue MSc, PhD, especially by research, we are expected to contribute to the body of knowledge. So that means that knowledge itself has not yet been created. So the challenge really is that your professor don't have the answer. You also don't have the answer. The rest of the people in the world are probably also researching the same thing. So you kind of have to, um, not to say grope in the dark, but you kind of have to have a belief, right? You have to have a hypothesis mm -hmm. and you have to test it with different logic to see whether it works. Yeah. If it works, right, what will it, what will cause it to not work, right? So there's, there's the positive hypothesis and the null hypothesis. We kind of test all these things. And I think, you know, to give us a bit more challenge, right? My professor was quite good in the strategy. He said, if at some point, let's write a paper published into international journals. Mm. Say, why? So he explained that if, as you publish into a refereed journal, there are expert people in that related field that already referee your paper. So if they have critical questions, they would have asked you those questions, right? And you need to address their concern or their queries and take that as a guidance of how to improve your research work. So I thought that was that was actually quite good strategy. So uh, uh, together we co-authored a couple of papers into internationally refereed uh, journals and uh, uh, quite a few, if not all, I think quite a few eventually got published. Now, when I say eventually, it's because they actually ask some questions, right? So they ask questions, then we sharpen the research in those areas, right? So. Over time, uh, it took, uh, took me four years, you know, uh, many, again, it is a part-time, right? I was still in the Tulu at that time until 2006 and I moved to KL. So there's still a lot of back and forth uh, with my two, two professors, you know. Uh, now I have two professors instead of one, two professors. Um, and, and we have a lot more correspondence with international researchers as well in the same area to see what are they doing, you know, for instance, in Canada, US, you know, UK. And um, that, that was actually a very good experience as in, even though I'm studying for uh, my own degree, but always have to keep out on the looks in, in terms of what's happening out there with the other researchers, right? So uh, 2008 came, uh, my external um, examiners are from, uh, foreign universities, right? So that's how serious it is, right? They always get someone from outside of the university to validate, uh, to conduct the viva and to validate um, the quality of the research, so to speak, right? So viva day came, presented, and wasn't a lot of correction. It was just minor correction. So I spent next couple of weeks touching up the thesis. And I graduated 2008, right? Um, the year that I turned 30, right? So I also kind of set a goal when I started PhD. I know if I don't have a goal, this thing can drag on long, long, long time, you know? So I said, hey, let's do it uh, by the time I'm 30. I kind of have that at the back of the mind, right? So kind of push, 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 push. Abyss, right? Uh, 
2008. So that's um, that is in a nutshell. Uh, and the, the, when you talk about challenge, right? Yeah. I think um, I was single uh, at the time when I was doing my MSc. Um, I got married to my wife 2006, right? Uh, kind of midway through the PhD, right? But uh, the study part, right, is very, it's very selfish, lah, so to speak, because uh, only, only I understand what I'm researching on, right? She wouldn't understand, right? And, and even, yeah. if, even if I spend time to explain <laughs> seriously, right, it's like, it, it took me so many months, uh, how can I explain in two minutes kind of thing, right? So it is actually very, very selfish. It's a very selfish journey that only you know, maybe your professor know kind of thing. Right? So my wife was, uh, she is very supportive in, in this, right? And thanks to her, right? Um, and at that time we have no children, right? Say, okay, um, finished the study. So um, with her support and whatnot, we finished uh, finish in 2008. And also in the same year, my our, our first, our eldest uh, daughter is born. So I, think you know um if we have uh, uh young children mm. i think i wouldn't have been able to compete because it's not fair to not uh to just spend time on the study and then you know having a young child and not look after the child i can or, or to depend on my wife to look after the child by herself so i think um we plan in such a way that right, you know we completed study first, right? So um, if not, then I think it will be extra challenging, right? In fact, at, even at this age, I think when I have two kids at home, um, <clears throat> I think if I were to do a full time study, it's probably still not the right time, right? I, you know, the next juncture to do a postgrad for me is maybe when they have gone to college or maybe when they don't want to talk to us anymore like that when they are older say my dad see you <laughs> uh, maybe at the time can. <laughs> now now it's still a very nice uh, age and you know family setting and whatnot um kind of have to consider that uh, so um the other part of really doing a research <clears throat> is or, or doing a postgrad study is financial stuff i mean um I did, I, I sponsored my own postgrad. Uh, UTP has a, a interesting program, right? Uh, in a sense that um, uh, for those who do full-time, you can also be a tutor in campus, right? So they kind of, I think, adjust the fee or something, right? I don't know what are the specifics today, but during my time, they kind of waive the fee and they kind of give also a small living uh, allowance, right? to help to help the students so but since i was off campus i got to pay right uh okay but over time this is not a lot of money but i think again it's the financial uh consideration uh, the, the the challenge is always there right um yeah i think it has been a very interesting journey um we'll talk a little bit of why i choose to stay with the same university and so on but you know all in all 12 years from start to end like, from the day I entered UTP in 1996 till I finished in 2008. Yeah, yeah. Listening to your story, Dr. Chan, I gather some of the um, uh, drive that you have uh, is inherent within yourself. What do I mean by that is that uh, you have a level of curiosity that's so high that drove you to continuously ask questions again and again. And when you were doing your um, Amoko stint, it sparked other questions on safety that brought you to um, extend on, on, on the, the range of questions of your, your study. Yeah? And number two, mm. I noticed that you learn as you go. Uh, because you, you you said earlier, you know, even, even as we become parents, that is a point whereby there's no manual that could prepare you for it, right? <laughs> now, now realizing those drivers, Dr. Chan, um, you were doing your study from a distance for quite some time, right? Mm. Um, in the realm 
of uh, part-time study, uh, people who hmm. do distance learning, people who do pendidikan jarak jauh PJJ hmm. um, is growing hmm. in number, especially today hmm. um, in hmm. the post-pandemic um, uh, learning situation whereby everything is being shifted online. Hmm. How do you maintain your spirit, your level of curiosity, your level of energy throughout those 12 years? It's a long time. That's more than a decade. But, but if we're just taking the part of your master's and your PhD, kan, um, I'm sure it wasn't just sustained at the top level. There were moments of, of peaks and throw. How do you yes, pick yes. yourself up? How do you motivate yourself and keep yourself going, lah, Dr. Chan? If you can <laughs> Yeah, I, I think you're, you're right, lah, um, Ashrif. If, if, I think the motivation part is very key, right? Um, especially for people who are doing by research, right? Um, literally, you don't have many people to talk to, right? Now, if you are in a class, you know, if you, if you go for MBA course, for example, then you have classmates and all this, right? And if you are down, then kind of got friends to kind of talk to etc now i think in my studies right it's not smooth sailing all the time right there are times where i really hit the wall right it's like where do i go from here right um, when you want to build a model and there's no way to build the model what else can i do right um i think what i did was that if i can't go on there is really no point sitting in front of a computer and try to click or type anymore, right? I just switch it off. I go out. I used to cycle a lot. So I kind of just cycle, go around, you know, have uh, fresh air or maybe that weekend just kill a bird. Just don't do it at all because there's just no, uh, no motivation or no, uh, what people call ill harm, you know? Mm. But at times when you have the ill harm to write, especially when writing the thesis, right? I can really write into late night and whatnot. I can just write and write and write and write and then sometimes bachelor lagi not correct and then erase and then redo and things like that. So for me, it is like if I hit a wall, better to just take a couple of steps back instead of keep knocking on the wall because you'll get injured. Right? So I kind of take a step back and say, okay, look, uh, stop, right? And sometimes one, two weeks, I just can't do it, then can't do it. Lah. And, or sometimes for people who are working, for example, I was working in the plant. Now, during a plant turnaround, is very hectic. No, frankly, during those times, I can't study, right? Because already so tired, you get back from the plant, it's like, oh, forget it, man. Just boom, want to rest. Right? So, uh, got to adjust to the rhythm of what's happening around, right? That's why I said, I, I, I complete all this when I don't have little children. Imagine if you have children, right? Kejap the baby, like this kejap baby. Like, I think it's going to be very difficult, right? So yeah, that's that's how I kind of keep it, uh, keep kind of uh, cool and yeah, <laughs> disengage when I have to disengage. Lah. <laughs> so what I capture from there, you have to step back and stay away kejap, right? From, mm, from study mm. just to refresh and <laughs> rejuvenate. Yeah? Mm, mm, Be mm. Before I go to the next question, Dr. Chan, um, my question to you is on how this experience since your postgraduate study has shaped the way you think and how that has helped you in developing your career. Um, the reason I'm asking this question is that um, a PhD is the um, development of knowledge, right? But other than that, it is also a competency building <laughs> exercise, right? We build our muscle across the areas of critical thinking, yes. analysis, and so forth. How that has shaped your thinking and how has it been beneficial for you in your career? And you, you strike the right chord, you know, um, it's developing of the muscle. Now, frankly, Whatever that I research is very academic, right? It doesn't doesn't happen or you know it's not really widely practiced even today, I believe, in the real world yet. Because academic research takes time to come to industry, right? It just takes time to mature, right? So 
as you pursue a PhD, you are at the cutting edge from a knowledge perspective, right? Very uh, cutting edge at that, at that point. And a PhD is very, very specific. You are solving a very specific problem within that particular area. So you become very good, very knowledgeable in that specific area. Now, this specific area may not apply to your day-to-day -day job. And frankly, my, my research doesn't apply good in my day-to-day -day job, right? But you are right, as we've uh, it's the development of the muscle, <clears throat> right, um, that matters. And I discovered this over time, right? Didn't know this when I start off. You know, in, in my undergrad years, one professor told us this, why do you come to university? He asked this question to the class. Oh, yeah, we come here to get a good job. No, we come here because we are told to come here. Yeah, partly yes. We come here because we really like to learn. Are you sure? So his reaction was all like that. Then he said, you guys, when you come to university, it's the schooling of your thought process that matters, mm -hmm. which is exactly what you mentioned. Right? It's the schooling of your thought process. So now when I reflect back, I think yes. Because especially in PhD studies, I'm researching on something that has no answers. Right? Mm -hmm. All I have is the tenacity to go and chart the way forward day by day, day by day, day by day. Right? You have a you have a plan and then you go. And all I can do is to apply logic from different, different sources, right? And test the hypothesis, right? And at the end of the day, if I look back, right? The whole four years of study, the conversation is, is something like, given some topic, even if you don't have the answer, you can always go and find the answer. So that is the biggest takeaway that I have. And that's why, you know, maybe it influences how I behave at work when, you know, I'm given a new job or a new assignment. You know, a lot of times I have no answer. I don't even know that job, right? But I say, fine, if I have done a research that has, you know, no answers and we managed to finish something, I'm sure I can apply the same thinking, right? So it's about the ability to ask questions to people, right? Um, don't be shy, right? Keep asking questions, right? Um, and learn, keep learning from everybody, right? And stack up what you learn into that direction that you want to go. That's what I learned. These are the two sets that I learned inadvertently by doing a PhD program, right? The critical thinking, the how do you, you know, connect the dots and things like that. Lah. Yeah. Great. So it goes beyond knowledge, and eh? it's a skill, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a skill, correct. And this skill is then very transferable. Uh. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, Dr. Chan, the third question that I have for you. One of the most common questions that I get asked about is how do I select a program? There are many factors that goes into the selection of a program. Um, source of funding, supervisor, location, mode of learning, uh, and many others, right? Um, and especially today, um, with COVID coming into the equation, <laughs> it makes answering that question becomes more complex. And also, answering the question, when do I do it? Right after college, or do I work for a few years, and so forth, right? So Dr. Chan, from your experience, um, uh, who have attained the doctorate degree, and who have applied that uh, at work, um, how should one choose a postgraduate study program and also a subject that comes uh, under that program uh, for him or her to pursue? What hmm. is the thought process that you would recommend, uh, Dr. Chan? I think, I think you touch on a few uh, factors already, right? Um, now, I would like to share um, how to, what to select to study. Right? No. I think in undergrad, we didn't really have the choice to select the, the, the subjects. Can. It's like, 
if you are chemical engineering, huh, these are the 15 <laughs> topics, uh, like it or not, you go study. <laughs> now, now in, in postgrad, you have control, yeah? As, as a candidate, you have control. You can decide what you want to study. So my, my, my tip number one is please pick something that you like to study, right? The passion, right? Don't pick something that is so dreadful <laughs> that it adds on to the stress, right? So that's how I look at it, right? Now, a lot of people say, I'm going to do an MBA, right? And, and if you start asking, why do you want to do an MBA, right? You ask yourself, right? Why do I want to do an MBA? Or if it's just to look good on my title, MBA, okay, that's one reason. But is it because you really want to know the subjects in MBA, John Do, right? Some subjects are very interesting, right? Um, as, as an engineer who have no uh, business training, I think if I ever do MBA, it's because I want to learn those management things, lah, right? Not because I want an MBA behind my name. So now going back to talk about the topic, really find something that is very passionate. In fact, last time, my this is my ex-boss at work. He know I'm doing chemical engineering. Gun. He said, you you already do chemical engineering, why you want to do postgrad in chemical engineering? If it was me, he's also a chemical engineer actually, if it was me, I would have done a master degree in music. <laughs> why? Because it's his passion. I see. Right? Now that he's retired, maybe he's doing it. Lah. He's actually a very good artist also, you know. But he, I, mean, I just wanted to share the point that if you're a chemical engineer, doesn't mean you must continue in engineering. Right, and in, in that case, uh, you can even go as far as uh, uh, music. Lah. Okay. So pick a topic, pick an area that you really love doing. Now, of course, we also have to be realistic because certain postgraduate degree you can only pursue if you have the fundamental degrees, right? Yeah. You can't say, for example, pursue a master's in medicine when you are not a medical graduate. Lah. I think that's just not possible. So those are the things that kind of the, the different tension points that you kind of need to uh, look at. Okay? So um, the next thing is the mode of studies, as you mentioned, Tadina, mode of studies is very important. Some people, they like to go to classrooms. Number one is because they say it's more discipline, I have to come, da, da, da. Mm. and secondly, they say, I like the interaction with people. Right. I can't, I just, I know myself, I just can't do it uh, by my own, right? by myself. Yeah. There, there are people who are like that. Okay? Mm. So the interaction, right, and so on. Now, again, you have to think about sometimes certain master's program, it is that interaction that really matters. Mm. Right? I think uh, you, you, did, uh, you did an MBA, right? Um, yeah your interaction with your fellow classmates in the MBA course, I would think is very valuable than just the subject on the paper, right? Definitely. Right? The, the exchange of views, I think is what you would treasure most. Yeah. So again, think about what, what you want to study and what mode might be there and what mode might be more uh, effective lah, for you and also what you will pick out from the program. Now, but when it comes to PhD, then I think it's a little bit difficult. PhD typically um, is research kind of thing because you are supposed to get into the frontier of knowledge where, you know, if there were lectures, it would be quite limited lectures, but it's a lot of research work. Now, <clears throat> research work means that you need to have a lot of tenacity. Lah. Mm. You just need to be able to stay the course, right? Uh, just as the title of your uh, talks. You just have to have that tenacity, right? Um, got to just plan it out, right? Now, there are programs that can stretch over many years. The, the university allow for it. But you also have to know if you stretch too long, the motivation factor may change, right? And a career along the path may change. You will naturally grow to get more and more responsibility at work, right? Um, who knows, you start a family, right? And those are all the different factors that you kind of need to look into lah, because it's not just about your study, it's about the life, your life mm -hmm. as well, right? So the other 
and, and relating closely to this is actually mental health. Lah. I think mental health is becoming a very big topic nowadays, right? Yeah. So choose the right time to pick the studies. No right, no wrong, right? Um, I saw in one of your uh, one of your guests the other day, he started at 49, right? Yeah. Right, 49. Uh, just started, right? So it, there might be good reasons, right? Maybe because his children are grown up and he has now a bit more free time, right? Uh, it's okay, right? Uh, for me, as I said, I finish before I have a family, right? So different points in life, you have different needs. Uh, um, I, some people actually go to postgraduate studies after they retire, right? Because after retirement, they are quite free lah, kan? Yeah. from that, from that uh, lens, right? Confirm free. So, <laughs> they might confirm free lah, right? Yeah. So the men, because it, it has a lot to do with the mental health, right? You have to really be mindful of all these things. I mean, studying is no joke. It's just very, it can be very stressful, right? So, and the last bit, right, maybe is about the choice of institution, like where to study, right? Um, <clears throat> a lot of people ask me, why you, why you continue with UTP, hmm. right? And then at that point, UTP is not a very well-known institution, okay? At that point, it's, it's, it's kind of brand new, you know, not like today. Today, UTP, I think, is a bit more uh, uh, you know, well-known in, in, in this region, but at that point, no. So a lot of people say, hey, with your qualifications, uh, you chemical engineering, you can do it in other universities, right? Why do you continue in UTP? So my reasoning was very simple. I didn't want the hassle to go and get into a new environment. UTP, I know it like the back of my hand, right? I, I, I was there and you know, I, I know everybody there. I know my professors there. And that was one of my reason, right? The other reason is I believe uh, you've got to choose a university that has the infrastructures and the capacity, capability to make it happen for you, right? Now, of course, uh, uh, I mean, this is not an advertisement for UTP. UTP, at that point in time, you know, we have probably one of the most extensive libraries, right? And already have very good professors. So to me, these are two very key ingredients and I'm doing it off campus. Lah, so, you know, it doesn't really matter how the campus looks like for me, right? I'm away from the campus. But for those who are kind of doing full time, then maybe location on campus kind of have to think about and you kind of get, get to need to go to the campus, etc, etc. So, so that's the gist of it, I think. Kind of, and there's no right or wrong, right? And you must be very clear what is the goal that you try to achieve, right? Uh, and then work out these few factors. Yeah lot to unpack here i'm getting in my notes number one passion <laughs> subject number two being practical on the mode of study being realistic in doing that as well mm. Um, mm. mental health is super uh, definitely significantly important and number four uh, understanding the true reason of choosing where you want to study mm. yeah dr chan mm. one hour just fly by that's how fascinating yeah. the story has been but before I close, Dr. Chan, any last words of advice for people like me who is just crawling my second year of my doctorate or others who are considering um, doing either in full-time or in part-time? Dr. Chan, any uh, final words of advice? So I think to, to you, uh, Asrif, all, all the very best, right? Uh, you have started on a very interesting journey, two years. Uh, I hope you can finish it in the next two to three years, right? Oh. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I think at the end of the journey, you will, you will have a kind of feeling which is very unique to yourself, mm. right? You know, what I felt is not going to be what you felt. But I think that sense of uh, completion, you will, you, will, you, will, you will feel it, right? Uh, so to do the rest of the to the rest of your listeners and whatnot. I think don't look at postgraduate study as something very dreadful, right? But also don't look at it as something very easy to do, 
uh, right? Not dreadful in a sense that it can be done, right? I have done it, many others have done it. Asif, you are doing it. I mean, you have already done two masters before, so, you know, and now you are doing PhD, right? So, I've, so it's not something impossible. It is something doable. Now, it is also not something easy because it's not a stroll in the park, obviously, right? So, but to really understand that and pace yourself, right? Don't, don't rush. There is really no rush because you already have a good life. You already have a degree. You're already working. So, so no rush. Pick the right thing that you really wanted to study and then pace it accordingly. So that's, that's my final words to, to, to you as well as all the friends out there. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Chan, thank you so much for spending your Sunday afternoon with us. I greatly likewise. <laughs> I greatly appreciate your sharing uh, on the eve uh, two days before our national day, uh, Dr. Chan. All the very best uh, in 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 your in your career and uh, my well my best wishes to you and family. Thank you, Dr. Chan. Thank you, Ashif. So salam mereka. Okay. Take care. Okay. Bye bye. Okay.